My name is Mark Woods. I became Haji Abdul Ghani when I came to Islam and made Hajj. I grew up in, a, as George Orwell described it, a, a lower, upper, middle-class family. Um, my father was in the Foreign Office. My mother was a diamond mining heiress from South Africa. And there were five, five brothers and sisters. Um, we lived abroad quite a lot in Poland and Italy. And my father had also been stationed in Tehran. My father was, or, or had become, by the time that I remember, a Church of England a regular church, church visitor. Um, he'd been through his atheistic period as a student, but had come back to the church and was a formal, regular Sunday worshipper and visited the elderly and people in the community. My mother was possibly a more spiritual woman, but was not a formal religious practitioner. She stayed at home on Sundays, but she had a strong sense of love of Jesus Christ, for want of a better word, and a strong sense of her own Jiminy Cricket or conscience. Of the two, I'd say my father expressed the outward form of religion. My mother had the inner, you know, in her heart. I went through the standard um, English boarding school system, which is um, almost the equivalent of being sent away to an institution, aged seven. So at seven, I was sent away from the family home, packed on a train with my bag, and, and sent away to a large house in the middle of the country with maybe 150 other boys, only boys, um, all white middle-class boys, um, so very monocultural and no experience of either the opposite gender or any other races or creeds. And from there I went on to another Church of England boarding school um, called Uppingham in the Midlands, which was again very white, very monocultural, all male and very little kind of spirituality either and I understandably got a bit frustrated with this and finally left but made my way then to Cambridge University where I took up the study of philosophy and then Chinese in order to perhaps understand this bizarre system we were growing up into. I should go on to say that, that when I went to my first boarding school at the age of seven, we had uh, regular worship every day. So we went to chapel every day. Every morning started with prayers, hymns, and lessons in the chapel. So religion became an important part of my life at school. It was one of the few sort of warm, nurturing environments in the school, and I became very close with the chaplain and became confirmed as a Christian uh, and fell in love with Jesus Christ. And having grown up in Poland and Italy, that sense of Jesus um, through the Catholic tradition had also been planted quite deep. However, my secondary school was very um, emotionally and spiritually frigid. And so, as I said, I then went on to study philosophy, Chinese and Buddhism um, my first experience of Islam was in Iran, which I visited in 1976, and I got a beautiful sweet flavour from the beautiful masjid in Isfahan, seeing the women gathering for prayer, the sense of tranquility, and the beautiful turquoise colours uh, of the mihrab. And, um, so definitely a sense of beauty being planted there, and we met an English lady who was in fact the mother of um, a close friend of Princess Diana's and um, she introduced us to Islam and later she also talked about Sufism and I developed a sense of, of, of a real secret beauty here. Um, but I didn't really follow it up at the time until I was teaching English as a second language in London and teaching a lot of Muslim families, both from Iran again and Pakistan and other Muslim countries. And I was strongly aware of their sense of family and cohesiveness, the warmth of their family bonds, uh, and something that was very lacking in the West, um, where we were very emotionally cold, our families mostly disintegrated, 
and no sense of strong family, large kinship bonds. And so I was really impressed with the warm, strong family, close-knit families these Muslim um, families had. And it wasn't until my mentor from my Buddhist group in South London actually introduced me to a Sufi sheikh from Turkish Cyprus um, that I really made my first direct contact with Islam as a possibility for myself as a way to follow. on the outskirts of Cambridge here in one of the suburban housing estates and we have a great divide of rich and poor in Cambridge, some of the wealthiest people in the country, um, one of the wealthiest universities and intellectual heights of the planet and also some of the main social problems of any inner city area. There are lots of churches and things dotted around here, a lot of churches in town. It's a very, um, perhaps traditionally Christian town or city, but of course with the intellectual work that goes on in the university, there's a lot of people who, who may have turned away from faith because of their intellectual um, explorations. Um, on the other hand you have some very intelligent scientific experts who are also Christian or Muslim so it's quite an interesting environment from that point of view. And just down here I'm going to take you into the little local Bengali community which is where I go and do my daily prayers. Um, and it's Bengali mosque and prayer room, very nice imam and it's in places like these that I find myself in Islam per se rather than any particular branch of Islam, just general local Islam. But again, you know, you have a place for Bengalis to pray but the white people in the area might feel, you know, wary about that. There was a pig's head deposited outside the mosque last year and there's a big problems there and we have about 50-50% in this little area, 50% Muslim, 50% non-Muslim and we constantly try and develop links and, and bring people closer. But, um, it can be an issue on both sides um, but you know, we can still keep trying and, and keep struggling with this. I'm just going to pull up here and then we can maybe go in and say salams to the, the mosque. سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله
we come down here, this is probably about the oldest part of Cambridge to be first inhabited. There's the old castle, Castle Hill, Castle Mound up here. And one of the oldest little churches that I come to for peace and quiet is now empty, but you can, you can go inside and, and just by the church is an art gallery that I've been working with for 30, 40 years, the modern art gallery, Kettle's Yard. And it's a real sanctuary here. And my sister is also planning works with me in this, in this area. Combining art and spirituality, principally, which is an important combination for the West because we mostly approach spirituality through art. Um, these days, unless people are a member of a faith community, which many aren't, and if they're not a member of a faith community, they may well find their peace and solace in an art gallery um, like this. And we're just coming up round the backs of the colleges here. There are a lot of theological colleges here. This is one theology college. A lot of people come here to study to be priests. There is also a Cambridge Muslim College for training imams, set up by the white Muslim professor of Islam at Cambridge. And, um, they were visiting the Buddhist centre the other day, where I happen to be. So we make quite a lot of links between the different communities where we can. We're just pulling into Trinity College here, one of the oldest and most famous colleges in Cambridge. This is where I studied in the 70s. I got my degree in philosophy and Chinese. It's the home of Isaac Newton. They, I think, have 40 Nobel Prize winners amongst their um, previous incumbents, more than any European country on its own or even put together. So it really is the height of the height and the creme de la creme of the intellectual establishment of the world, really. And I was honoured enough to be able to come here the year after Prince Charles, I came the year after he left. I decided to study philosophy here when I got a place at Trinity in order to investigate the meaning of life and to look at the foundations of science and the arts and, and see you know, what it was all really about. And once I discovered the work of the later Wittgenstein, I, I decided it was not really what it was all about, but, but what use we put it to. It wasn't so much what life gave to us, but what we made of life that, that made it meaningful. Uh, and therefore I decided to study Chinese as, as a completely different picture of the world, a mirror image if you like, and also with a view to career, and pursued my study of meaning through meditation, and it was the study of meditation and my continued training in spirituality that led to my meeting with um, Sheikh Nazim in 1984, uh, five years after I left university, and my conversion to Islam. And in that sense, having studied philosophy and decided that uh, meaning was something that we made out of life, um, it was through Islam that I found a way of making life meaningful in community. Behind us is the Wren Library, which is um, the oldest collections of books in this country. I think Newton's works are stored there. Winnie the Poohs, um, my uncle happened to be librarian there for 20 years and um, it's one of the more famous buildings of um, Cambridge and Trinity. Um, these are the cloisters, almost typical monastic kind of structure and a lot of these colleges were based on religious institutions, monasteries, before they became colleges of higher academic learning around the time of the dissolution of the monasteries. In Henry VIII's time, he was the founder of this college. After Cambridge, I was living in London. We were going to a 
Buddhist centre in South London, my wife and I. And then one day, my friend Nicholas took us up to this um, kind of alternative hippie centre in North London. And we met these brothers and sisters sitting on a green carpet, praying, doing the dhikr, chanting Allah, 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 you know, and, and dressed in beautiful clothes and women wearing their scarves and, and sharing food afterwards. And there's a real sense of warmth amongst the gathering that we didn't have in our Buddhist group. And then after about a month of going there regularly on a Thursday evening, um, the Sheikh arrived from Turkish Cyprus at the beginning of Ramadan in 1984. And um, he gave his first talk and, and um, you know, he talked about Jesus Christ. He talked about you know, the light and he talked in a very clean and, and there was a real sense of light coming through him and it was you know, immediately attractive. We'd already experienced the warmth of the brotherhood and the sisterhood and there was a sense of light as well. And I was introduced to him afterwards and he, he took one look at me and he said, this one is sincere. And I took that to be a fairly good sign. This is the area I first made my contact with Islam. I became a Muslim here with Sheikh Nazim from Turkish Cyprus. And um, we used to walk these streets. Um, he had his turban and his lamb gown, the Sunnah of the Prophet. And we prayed at Peckham Mosque not far from here over the Burgess Park. And he lived in a little Turkish grocer's shop here where he would hold court on the first floor and we would sit and listen to his cookbook. It was a very beautiful time. Yes, my initial contact with Islam was, was through Sufism. Um, I, in a sense, didn't feel I really truly became a Muslim until I went on Hajj in 91. I converted in 84 and went on Hajj, Hajj al in 91. And it was finally when I made the Hajj that I felt, you know, I truly become a Muslim in the wider sense of the word, of becoming part of the Ummah, the wider Muslim community, rather than just a particular group within it. My experience of Hajj was, was a remarkable experience. Um, we went as a small group, but once we got there, there were three to five million people all dressed in the same ihram. And we were very much, you know, submitting as, as a, you know, en masse, you know, as, as a great congregation um, before the Kaaba, before God, and one felt a profound sense of obeisance and, and, and Islam in that, in that context. And I was very fortunate to be carried across the, the, the crowd to kiss you know, the sacred stone. And um, one had a sense of being part of something truly global and, and you know, much larger than oneself or any particular aspect of it. I've come down to see my sister Emma. It's uh, open studio, um, Peckham Arches. Um, this is the Christmas show, and this happens every year. Although we have a monthly, regular open studio, and Emma's been here for five years or so doing her ceramics and beautiful work. And it's an opportunity for me to come down and see her, because she's been coming up to Cambridge for some time, and I wanted to come and support her work here. I made my conversion to Islam very near here in Peckham, so it's very much coming back here, it's coming back to my roots in Islam. My family had no great problem with it. I don't think Emma had any strong reactions for or against. Uh, my father was a bit taken aback, but my sister was very much embracing my way. Yeah, it's been an interesting journey that I haven't found 
any hostility amongst my siblings. As I say, my father came from a different intellectual background and struggled at first, but my sister is always, as far as I know, being supportive. I very much appreciate what she's doing and, you know, very impressed with her work here, obviously, incredibly so. Yeah, I was worried. I suppose I was worried that, um, that he'd choose, not about, not about choosing Islam, but, but about that, he'd be, that he could have an extreme tendencies and he'd follow anything too, too strongly or you know, just not keep it in balance. Um, but over the years, I've seen how he's managed to keep it in balance. And, you know, I, I believe Christianity and Islam share so much. And that uh, I believe firmly that um, both religions want the same for mankind and want, you know, for the betterment of ourselves and things. So it's not a problem to me. Um, I think it's just good to have something to believe in and to... Uh, follow a path and you you know I choose to follow my own I sort of I try to feel the best out of everything and follow my own path and I think for Mark he needed something that was set and it worked you know having having sort of a path to follow I know he was searching so it gave he'd found what he was searching for so I think that was a major benefit um, and yeah, I think it, it, it um, met a need that he, that he needed something to follow and to something, some, a container for your beliefs, you know, sort of, so that you're not just, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm the other way, I'm happy not having too many borders to it. And, and, but I think for him, he needed to have one thing. And, uh, and through his search of various philosophies and things and doing philosophy at Cambridge and stuff. I think it, you know, he, he arrived at it and it was the right one that suited him. And uh, so I think it's met his need in that way, I think, so, yeah. I think one of the great things that Western society is lacking is this sense of community. Everyone is very alienated and isolated in the West, in the cities. People are as lonely as anywhere in the cities. And this sense of community, of brotherhood and sisterhood that is so strong in Islam is, is one of its great strengths. And I think also the sense of meaning and purpose. People in the advent of modern science and, and the kind of atheism that's brought in its wake have become very lost. And, you know, I think it's... it's it's very important for people to have a deeper sense of purpose and meaning about why they're human and what they can do as humans. And certainly reflecting on the teachings of Islam and the Prophet Muhammad and the community context which that gives you know, is, is, is something that can be of great benefit to people in the West.